to talk about on camera and we'll edit it however we need to edit it. Right. But you're tell I want I mean I love that, that idea of your YouTube channel because it's uh that's what we're doing, we're trying to do, and we realize there's not that out there right now. Now it's it's unfair, you have a lot more connections than we have. So like we have, <laughs> I, have to, I have to harass people on Instagram until they say yes. Um, well, how, long, how long did it take me? Uh let's see, I started back in july august and then all right I, persistence chris <laughs> so, there we go so it worked and then but uh no but it, it's been we're fascinated we love the art we love what like you're talking about you're talking to james stan we love that hearing the stories like we've heard now we've had guys that you you can tell they're not as enthused about doing it but we've had we've had guys from <laughs> Lee Lowridge was on last week talking about yep. books that he's did, and he's just telling stories about being a colorist. And he was on, yep. he was sort of impressed, just like, "Hey, we're asking a colorist to talk about being a colorist, um, yeah. and that type of stuff." It was a lot. It was a lot of fun. Mike's having some internet problems, so hopefully he'll figure it out as he's switching cool. in and out. Uh, but, but no, that's I love that idea of reaching out, and especially because you have all those guys on Boom that you have because you've you've pulled in some amazing artists here lately. Though you've always had them. I think it's one of those, the comic industry, the fans are paying attention to you and to scouts and to uh, AWA and all you, all this ID, IDW instead of just being in the big three. I mean, you, you've stepped into the big three. I don't know if you caught my article. I'm like, you're one of the big, now it's the big four. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Well, part of, you know, sort of that idea of um, with the interview show is that it's, you know, make something that's really in depth. And I was really inspired by Mark Marin has a show called WTF mm. where he interviews celebrities. Usually they're musicians or they're actors. And, you know, I've produced some movies and I'm fortunate enough to be my wife's a screenwriter. And so I've gotten to know actors through the years. And it's very fascinating on a craft basis to understand what do they do? How do they do it? and really get in there. And I thought, you know, that sort of format where it's just a conversation, because it's like the time in conversation, that's almost exactly the kind of conversation that I would have had at dinner with him at New York Comic Con, where I would just sit down and be like, okay, dude, how'd you create punchline? Like just laid out. Like yeah. I want to know everything. <laughs> and it's so funny because one of the first comments that I got was stop interrupting the guests. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I'm sort of like, I'm sorry, bro. Like this is the show. Like yeah. you know, you're just gonna have to deal with the fact that I'm gonna stop tying it and I'm gonna interrupt and I'm gonna ask him questions uh, well, because I want to know. It should be a conversation too. I mean, that's part of it. It's it's yeah. to make to make each other feel comfortable and make it feel organic. I mean, yeah. that's the way that's got to go, or otherwise it's just it's boring. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, that everybody has different expectations. You know, um, I, it's clear that that person wanted a more sort of like traditional, like 60 minutes kind of interview style where yeah. it's like you stop and then the person answers and then you ask the question. But I don't think but, you get the same response as James is not going to respond. Or we, we've noticed as we pepper you guys with questions, but it's not a boom, boom. We don't have a list of questions. We, we, we just right. as you bring up something, we will feed off of what you say. And we've learned that we get sort of honest answers and like, and I think you did that by peppering him in the middle of interrupting him. You're going, Hey, okay. And he, you, you pull out something out of the story and he'll go elaborate on something that might not have been elaborated on before we learned, we are one of our first interviews yeah. with Mike Mayhew. And yeah. we, one of my favorite things we learned is for us, we're, we're geeked out over his covers and everything. His, he did that Vampirilla run back a long time ago and he yeah. told us where he got his model. And like, and he yeah. talked about hiring this Ford dealership model. And it's like, that's such a cool story that I didn't know yeah. that's what artists did. And it was, Mike, like, it was just such Mike's a, a great guy. Mike, Mike did a cover for me when I was just starting boom and did an extraordinary job was a delight to work with. He's just a great dude. Yeah. The, the other thing is, you know, I'm over on Instagram mm -hmm. and I'm answering fan questions and you know, it all kind of kicked off in a really fun way. Yeah. Chris is like, what? Um, no, what I, happened, I cracked up at it when you did yeah. with that first guy who was harassing you. <laughs> well, that's, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to say he was harassing me, but what was hilarious was he was messaging me and he was going like, are you the CEO? Right. Yeah. Are you the CEO and will you publish me? And I get that question so many times, like, will you publish me? Will you publish me? Will you publish me? 
And so I just made a video to respond. But what was clear to me, it goes to what we were talking about before, which is like, there's just people are not telling people how to break in. Yeah. yeah. And people are not having a frank conversation. The analogy, uh, nice turtles. I bought that book off the rack. The um, there you bought that one too. Yep, <laughs> got them signed by Kevin in the garage. Um, the uh, the the what what happens with what I always like to explain to fans is you don't go to an NBA basketball game and sit in the bleachers <laughs> and then go down and walk up to the coach and say, "Put me in." There you go. Right? I got you. I got you. So true. I mean, that's a great analogy. That doesn't make any sense, right? Now, that's not to say, like, maybe you're Michael Jordan. And, you know, the best example I can think of that is Donnie Cates, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Donnie, you know, like, Tynan's breaking in story is crazy. Yeah. So what, what happens is, is he meets Scott Snyder, who's not Scott Snyder yet. He's a professor. And he basically takes Scott Snyder's class and starts talking to him about comics when Vertigo comes knocking to do American Vampire. And off he goes, right? So, like, what a crazy breaking in story. Or, you know, Kieran Gillen. What's his breaking in story? Kieran Gillen was a legit video game. Like, Kieran Gillen wrote a review, wrote reviews about video games for, like, 15 years, and he wrote a manifesto. So, like, in the video game community, Kieran Gillen is legendary. <laughs> and so, like, he turned into this major writer in video games as well as music and then went into comics, which is like, oh, yeah, I've got a recommendation for you breaking in. Why don't you go conquer the land of video games, then conquer the land of music, and then go conquer the land of comics? Like, that's really hard, right? Yeah. But you look at Donny Cates. Donny Cates... He broke in at smaller publishers and laddered his way up. Yeah. And then when he did God Country, that was the big breakthrough book. And they got on, and then Marvel came knocking and gave him a deal. And then you have crossover off the back of all of his Marvel work. And you've got a very clean story about like if you, you know, eat your vegetables and do your work, you know, Donnie. And, you know, like I, I was saying hi to Donnie at San Diego Comic Con for years as he was breaking in. You know, like we'd see each other crossing the hall, and I'd be like, "What's up, dude?" You know, and he's Chris, Donnie. Chris Kate. and I, Chris and I met him at this show where there. Were, how many customers were at that show, Chris? Ten. It was a Friday, and there's like 15 people, and Donnie sat there, and nobody the whole time. And I drove up there just just to interview him, and we talked for a long time. This is this is uh, early Venom. It's like on issue three at this point. So the goes on. Just, he just created him. Yeah, and he told me that story, and he said, you know, he he was he was a sequential. He was doing sequential art at the time, and he was in the class. and And Snyder told him, dude, I think maybe you should think about writing instead of sequential art because you're not all that great at the sequential art part, but you're a really good writer. <laughs> and uh, and that's that's that change happened. And then Donnie drew me a picture of Venom at the end of that interview, and Snyder was right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, the, so to go back to the analogy of the NBA, is you look at somebody like Donnie who went and played street ball and then played, you know, NCAA and then, you know, got, got his way into the NBA. And and part of it for me is like, I look around and nobody's sharing this information. And so I'll go on Instagram and I'll make a short video. You know, a lot of fans have been asking questions and I'll just pile up the questions, put them all in a video and say this, that, and the other. And you know, like one of the, one of the other writers, there was another guy who was asking about breaking in and writing and everything. And I was like, you know, you got to look at, I'm publishing James Tynan. I'm publishing Kieran Gillen. I'm publishing Brian Azzarello. I've got behind that Tom Taylor, Al Ewing, right? Greg Pak, the guy that created Planet Hulk, which was used for Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. yeah. Like, and I don't have infinite slots, right? Yeah. So, and you know, the funny thing is on Instagram, everybody's like, I want to write Power Rangers. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, like, am I going to go shoot Ryan Parrott? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, right? the, guy, yeah. the, the guy just posted up some of the best numbers we've ever gotten on Power Rangers and completely, you know, the, the franchise is new life and we've got Mighty Morphin number one, we got Power Rangers number one. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's your competition. So, <laughs> I mean, well, do better. I, yeah. I well, loved it. Your first well, you, it, 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 <laughs> go do better. Let me, let me work off that idea for a second. Because I think it's the right idea. You're saying it in a fun way. But really what the idea is, is what Donnie did when he broke in was he he generated value, right? And so he did enough stories where you understood his voice and you got, you're like, oh, this is who, what a Donnie Kate story is. Yeah, you had a voice. You know? And then you can start to conceptualize where that goes in the pu publishing lineup. Yeah. You know, people always are like, I write, I, I'm sorry, Chris, I keep interrupting. No, you're Everyone's like, you know, I'll write Power Rangers for free. I'm like, I don't want people to write for free. <laughs> I want to pay people to write. Like, yeah. that's not an inducement, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, like, I recall that first video because it, it blew me away because, like, dude, this is a publisher of a company who's one of the big comp becoming one of the big companies now giving advice to someone. And one thing that stuck out, because I have a buddy who it, it won't ever actually reach out to people, but he's a decent artist. I'm not trying to sell him at all. But I've told him, I was like, dude, watch this video that you did. And I sent it to him. And I was like, wow, you're telling you. people to, you said, if you claim to be an artist, freaking publish your art, put it on IG and let people criticize you. And then, yep. and then like, and Ben or CBSI, our, our sort of leader at the CBSI or whatever, he started teaching us how to hashtag. And like mm -hmm. learning how to, you can't just put it out there and say art. You have to go, no, I'm going to tag people and I'm going to tag people so they notice it. And I'm going to tag the right people. It doesn't do any good for me to tag you unless I'm, hey, I'm a, I want you to tag because this is what I'm doing. I love what you did with something's killing the children or whatever and going through it or even going going back to, man, the Lumberjanes was my jam back in the day and that type of stuff. Well, so, I'll, I'll give you a hack right here that's real simple if you want to get my attention, Okay is we put out blank covers for something is killing the children. And what people have been doing is they've been Ooh, doing art on the blank covers, yeah. right? And what I do that when they tag me is I share it to my Instagram story. And so I'm showing them to my audience, yeah. right? So that's a great way to get exposure. And yeah, we, we interviewed uh, James, uh, John R. Cutie. He does yep. that. He's, he is great. He doesn't post anything yet because he, he's not the artist. He's a writer. But he the, he posts all the time. He just gives get people props. And he'll just say, hey, man, this guy's great. And he'll tweet, tweet about it or Instagram it. It's great. Like, I follow him strictly because of that. And then we, we talked to him. It was just a great interview. Um, yeah. But... So and that's, I mean, that's that's a great thing for, for all any of you guys. I think that's, Chris, you were saying that too, is that you don't expect someone of your stature to really be talking to the fans all that much. I mean, maybe a little brief, Hey, thanks. A little fire emoji or something like that. But in general, not to actually give yeah. you know real, real feedback. That's rare. And it's really awesome. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, I just hope everybody's patient because it's something that like I get up really early in the morning. And so <laughs> that's usually I, best for me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I can, you know, the old military thing of like, I can get, you know, an entire day's worth of work done before anybody wakes up. And so then that gives me, cause you know, it's, you got to run a company, yeah. but the, the idea is, is if I can um, share something, you know, and again, that comes back to creating value, right? What we're telling aspiring writers or aspiring artists is create value. And, and then you have something that people get excited about. And, you know, my hope is I can create some value and um, then, you know, People get excited. They're interested, and 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 you know, look what you're hoping is there's another James Tynan out there, right? And you know, they become a big time creator, and then they go, "Hey, the reason that I focused and paid attention was you did that interview with you know Chris, Mike, and Peter, and it you know was the hot poker that got me going, and I yeah. always appreciate that." But. I guess I, I, when did you, now I have to admit, I, ha, I had not followed you the entire, your entire Instagram career or whatever, but when did you start making shocked, that? Outraged, shocked, outraged. <laughs> but You're fired. Like I, and we started this show, like the pandemic caused a lot of people to change how they interacted yep. in the comics world. 
did that sort of change for you as well? Is like, okay, I'm not going to be doing the shows. So how am I going to get my brand and boom? I mean, you, it timed perfectly in my opinion, something's killing the children came out just before it happened. And then it was a freaking character who wore a mask. Wore a mask. <laughs> so I, I mean, to me, it was like, Oh, it's the perfect mask for, Hey, we got to wear a mask. Let's put this, the slaughter mask on and go for it. And people start making own that them. mask. I was very excited to find one. Thank you. That's a, it's a very expensive mask to get your hands on now. People are uh, the ones we gave out at New York Comic Con are going for a pretty penny. Um, and and you know, and then my joke, Mike, would be, I don't have any, so don't. Have any. Um, you knew we were going to ask. Me. Yeah. So uh, hey, I'm a collector. I get it. So. And, and, and by the way, for your uh, edification, this is what's on the desk. Oops. Ooh. Wait, wait, show that again. Um, let's make it big so we can 9.2. Oh, wow. wow. That's, That's pretty, beauty. My mouth isn't working. Thank you. So, <laughs> my mouth doesn't either. It's too much drool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, Morello, I know that you you guys, all of you have books that put those to shame. So um, <laughs> the, the thing with, with COVID hitting, you know, what – I'm going to give you an, a, um, a shocking answer that you're not expecting. <laughs> so, you know, I've been to, yeah, I've been to <laughs> San Diego uh, since 1992 every single year. And oh, only wow. one of those did I go as a fan. And so as much as I love that show and the people that put it on are brilliant and amazing, it was really nice to take a break. Okay. And New York Comic Con will crush you. You know, that's a great show. Those are great folks. But New York's like, that's an intense scene. And there's a lot of people. And it's work, you know, and it's a nonstop punishing schedule of work. Uh, this and then this and then this and then this. And you're all on your feet and you're on all day. And you, your day starts at 6 a.m. And it ends at 2 in the morning. And, you know, you had a meeting with a licensor and you got to get up in the morning and put the notes down and email the team and make sure that everything's captured fresh. So I, for one, it's nice to take a break from the shows because they're not social for me. Um, but our attitude going into the shutdown was that we needed to connect with fans and we needed to connect with retailers. But the retailers were facing a situation after shutdown where you have no idea if anybody's going to come shop in the store. Now, what happened was sales went up. And, you know, that first FOC time period and, and just to break it down for a second, there was two weeks worth of books that were in the pipe during the shutdown. Yeah. So there was a set of bike, uh, a set of books that were at Diamond, and there was a set of books that had just been printed by the printer that were on the docks to go to Diamond. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when we came out of it, we FOC the latest issue of Faithless Stew, the Azarella book. Ah, uh, yeah, I like that book. And we had gotten orders before the shutdown. Yeah. And the book and the sales went up after shutdown. Same book. Hmm. Okay. Then the next week we get the FOC numbers. They go up three percent. Then the next week they go up eight percent. And what we all know now is that fans wanted stuff to read and they wanted yeah. to support their local retail. Okay. But what we did was we threw a safety net out and we said, look. All of our books are returnable. Now, this new returnable thing that's been going on in the direct market, we're yeah. the guys that started it. Okay. I, I talked to a shop uh, this past week, and they they bragged on the, you guys because he was like, dude, boom is the stuff. The, they came out, I, I, they said August. I think it's when I saw the articles, August it was when it was written. They came out and they said it's fully returnable. And it, like, it makes it our life so much easier. But the thing is, at the same time you guys did that, you started making finding the right artists at the right time to do one for 25s and then those thank you variants. And mm -hmm. that drove the market so far. I mean, you had Momoko before she was Momoko. You you pulled in uh, Mike's favorite Jenny Frisson uh, to do mm -hmm. do a set do covers. I mean, you got Franny who I can't find any covers other than your place and she, uh, first off, guy or girl. Uh, uh, it's Justine. Yes, so, I, I've never seen the first. I only see Franny. Like it's not listed <laughs> anywhere. Yep. So like those those 
artists are just blowing it out of the water on top of pulling in like you're in Huck Lee for a one for 100 Power Rangers cover and all those different things. Sorry, I do the new comic book day every list. Yep. So I, I keep track of all the ones that you do because you and blow thank, it out. And thank Tula Lote, thank Tula oh. Lote for me for those uh, sealed, those sealed variants that um. <laughs> oh, okay. Right so, so here's your story on the sealed variant <laughs> that you'll enjoy. Okay. So Azarello, we did the first mini series with Faithless. Yeah. Which by the way, Paul Pope, you got him to do cover art. I mean, oh, yeah. wow. Pope was awesome. <laughs> I'm a I'm a I own Paul Pope original art, and Paul and I go back about 25 years. Wait, but that, for what though? Uh, what did Faith you wait for? did the art he did it because he loves his editor uh, sierra han who's a genius and sierra also did you know the azarello book so we're, we go out to azarello we, we do the first mini we're done and um we go out to dinner with azarello and azarello is one of my favorite people he is cranky af okay <laughs> he reminds me of one of my dad's <laughs> best friends it's the sort of folks that i grew up with okay he loves he loves to you know He's, he, he loves to, let's say he's not a pushover, all right? <laughs> and so Azarello, you know, like Tynan is a sweetheart. Karen Gillan, you just like, I'll never stop talking to Karen Gillan. Like he's just a blast, right? Azarello, you know, well, people are scared of Brian, okay? <laughs> so I'm not, but I love him. But I'm sitting, at, I'm sitting at dinner and he says, okay, now that the project's done, I want to tell you what I didn't like about working with Boom. <laughs> it's like yeah. I got paid, so now I'm like bitch a little bit. Start to a conversation. <laughs> yep. And then he leans in and he says nothing. <laughs> okay. So hallelujah. Okay. And then I say, Brian, that means the world to me. I really appreciate that. Now let's talk about the Tula Lote covers. Okay, let me explain to you how we did these two little take covers. And he was like, I know, like, wow, how did we even get away with that? And I was like, let me explain to you how this worked. They came to me and they said, this is what we want to do, my interviews. Okay. And I said, that's a great idea. That's insanity. Nuts. People are going to freak out. Awesome. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. And then they came to me and they said, we've got the first erotic cover and we, we're going to send it over to you. And I said, oh, no, 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 do not send me that book. And they said, what do you mean? Aren't you worried about the content? And I said, yeah, I am. Because if I look at it, I will not want to look at it. Okay. <laughs> So don't ever show me any of this. Okay. <laughs> That's a nice so bleeding, <laughs> do you remember when Bleeding Cool did that article in Faithless 2 about the, the bag had been printed wrong? And <laughs> it didn't cover up the art? <laughs> right? It was printed backwards. Oh, yeah. You could see the art. That was the first time I ever saw a, a Faithless 2 little take cover. <laughs> oh, so you, you still haven't seen Or is that just that? No. Person? I don't want to know that. I don't want to see any of that. So you must I not say, I love the bag process that you guys have, though. I love having that insert that covers the cover because then I can use that in my bag and board to cover the cover. So in case nice. anybody's flipping through my box, like I know what it is, but nobody else can accidentally see it. Yeah, yeah. smart. I got, yeah. I got a little. Kind of it's, it's, it's a connecting set. I got to see how it connects. <laughs> hey, hey! Thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you for supporting the tomorrow. Partner. Tomorrow, I get the. <laughs> Look, it's awesome, but it, just as the publisher, I know that I'll figure out how much trouble we're going to get into, and I'll want to pull us back. And so I'm just going to get get out of the way, let everybody do their thing, and it's worked like a charm. It's been a it's been terrific. The series has sold; it's a huge hit for us, and it's done really well. So I'm only happy and thankful. Azarello could not believe that I refused to look. At the cover, he was so excited. <laughs> He's like, I have a publisher that's not crawling up my tailpipe telling me that I can't do things. So <laughs> He doesn't even want to know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I love that they were all women. No, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's that was an essential. Letting creators create, I got and that that is that's not something you see all the time. 
Ken uh, Bartel well, and Jenny Frisson you know, and a couple of different ones in the first series. Mm. Yeah, I mean, part of the process is, you know, this is worth, this is something that might be interesting to your audience. I don't know. Maybe I'll bore everybody to tears. But, you know, Image is an incredible company and they are amazing. And I think what they have done in the business is staggering. They will forever have uh, broken uh, through and created something totally new in publishing. But the thing about it is you are doing it on your own. Right. Yeah. And so that's the virtue of it. That's the thing that's great. But it's also the flip side is, is you don't have an editor, you know, you don't have, um, you know, sort of a support structure that you do from a traditional publisher. And so for us, my aspiration is, is I don't want to be image comics. There's already an image comics and I can't be image comics because I'm not Todd McFarlane. Right. Yeah. So instead we have editors that support the process. And so if you're a creator, that doesn't want to, you know, like if, if your thought, if you think about it for a second is maybe a better way to talk about it is Karen Gillen. So Karen did Wicked and Divine, okay? Yeah. And uh, Die at Image. But the thing about those is he's managing the artist through that process. Yeah. And so when he came to do um, Once a Future with us, he was like, I love this because I don't have to worry about the artist. Like in essence, he's being the editor at image and he's putting everything together. And when he comes to boom, he can just focus on writing and we'll market the book. And we have a Simon and Schuster book deal. And so we sell through Simon and Schuster to book uh, stores as well as to Amazon. And so we do all that and we do the international. We just basically, we do everything. So do you, um, do you do you recruit the writers to write your stories, or they come to you with a story and you say yes, we'll get that, we'll do the, we'll find you an artist to go with you? Like which way? We prefer to not have an artist attached. So and they come uh, with a story, and then you say okay, and we'll we'll pull in artists that we we have our people that we know or we've heard about this person. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like the conversation with Kieran was a little different because we um, sent Kieran Dan's artwork and thought Kieran would really like Dan's artwork. Yeah. And so that happened very early in the process. I think that that happened even before he had come up with the idea. And so we were like, we've got Dan. We think you, you know, he was working on Klaus with Grant Morrison. We think he'd be a great uh, match for you. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. And so. That worked, but but generally speaking, you know the the thing about artists pairing a writer with an artist, it, when a, when a writer is pairing themselves with an artist, a lot of times you might have two guys that are friends and they get along well, but they might not be right for the project. Yeah, you know. So like yeah. if if I told you that I was going to pair Alan Moore with you know Todd McFarlane, and they were going to do Watchmen together. You know, you don't want Todd McFarlane doing nine panel grids, right? Like that doesn't, you know, now they're legends. They're the greatest, right? Yeah. But it's like, it's not a good pairing. Now they might, you know, Alan and Todd might have been friends mm. and wanted to work together. And I get it and it's cool. But at the same time, you'd pitch that to me and I'd be like, ah, hey, Alan, can we go find the right match for the project? You know, and hey, Todd, hey, you know, what's going on? <laughs> that reminds me of All Star Batman yeah. with Frank Miller and Jim Lee. Like it just didn't really work. Yeah. Like, together, like yeah. the two of them together. Like Jim Lee might have loved Frank Miller's art, and but just the book itself just didn't work with the two of them. Well, and, to, and my, you go back to you know you say then they'll go call Image, and that's fine. You know, it's like for me, I think that we present very different value propositions, mm -hmm. and so. If you're in the mode of, hey, I'm going to go do this book, and you know, Image generally solicits when there's three issues on spec in the can, yeah, right. And so you're like, hey, I'm going to go do this book on my own uh, force of will, and you know, I'm going to bank these pages and I'm going to go do it. Great, but there's a lot of folks that they can't do that because they have a wife and kids, and they need to get paid uh, on the upfront part, mm. and so um, that's where we present you know, we pay up front on Patriots. So anyway, it's a little too biz oriented. I don't know if you want to plunge in on the three books we want to talk yeah. about. Tonight. 
Oh, for uh, for sure. Well, and actually, it's perfect lead in. Um, I mean, got here. Hey, guys, we're through Comic Money. We've been talking for <laughs> minutes about it. Sure uh, this week, we have Ross Richie here with us uh, from Boom. Uh, he's if you haven't seen, he's been around. He's he's promoting stuff. He's I mean, obviously, an awesome dude. Just hearing him talk about different things. Uh, if you don't sure. follow him on Instagram, we're going to have all that stuff on our site. So you can see all the different ways to follow him. He's starting a YouTube channel, but he has chosen an awesome topic for us. He didn't really give us a topic. We took his books and we made it into a topic. Um, but uh, the topic we've decided to call it innovation. Um, and it's a perfect topic for him because he already talked about one of the things I was going to bring up in reference to innovation, this entire bring stores being able to give you back the books. The um, that, that is, Yeah, it's... Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, you know, there's a story there that I forgot to tell, and then maybe we'll get into the books, but I think you'd get a kick out of it. you get a kick out of it. Because we're talking about Peach, and um, she did that cover on Wind, number one. Yeah. And the way that that book came together was we had, uh, we were sitting here looking at post lockdown that stores didn't have anything to sell. And I knew that we had a graphic novel, uh, actually a, a series of graphic novels, but we had the first graphic novel was finished by Tynan. And it was supposed to come out as a graphic novel, not a comic book. That explains and, so much. Because <laughs> it's, it's such a thick so book. Yes, exactly. And so it was in the can, it was done. And um, I, I basically called Tynan up and I said, I got a crazy idea. You know, what if we break this thing into individual issues and we put it out as comics? Well, when I first came up with this idea, the staff said, you can't do that. And I said, why? And they said, the what? thing is, <laughs> what, what am I? I can do whatever I want. <laughs> well, there are limitations in space and time. Checks and balances, and I, my friend. Checks and balances. <laughs> and my just I just realized that. <laughs> and Mike, I generally find that I, I do not let the limitations of space and time stop me. <laughs> so, you got to you back. <laughs> so they said you can't do that. And the reason you can't do that is uh, previews. So there's not enough time to send the solicitation information to Diamond, have them collate it all, put it into the book, distribute it to retailers, get the orders, and then foc the book okay and so i said yeah 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 what if we blow off previews okay <laughs> this is the worst idea in the history of bad ideas okay <laughs> the order process are you kidding me and what i thought was we'll go straight to foc okay and let's roll the dice and take a shot and a chance on this thing and what it laid out was we had five days to market the book before orders. We basically announced on a Monday, okay, and we had five working days, and then the following Monday, the orders were due, okay? And what I thought was it was so crazy that when we announced it, that people's heads would explode. And that that would get the attention that we needed mm. to sell the book. And it worked. So it turned out to be, at the time, that first issue, the first printing, outsold something's killing the children. First printing. Now, something went through like eight printings and it's ended yeah. up, it's climbing towards 80,000 copies now because of the uh, local comic shop variant. Yeah, all that's right. The comic shop variant got ordered through the roof. I'm sure because sure. uh, there's like a gold version of it or a foil or something. Yeah. It's a foil version. Yep. Yeah. And so, um, that, that really, that yay. Would, yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to hunt that down. Thanks. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. 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 Well, um, <laughs> so it, so that, that was a fun thing. And so to me, it's like, you know, how do you create a safety net for your retailers? And then how do you give them something to sell? You know, once it was clear that they didn't have anything to sell and the market was coming back, we really, and if you remember during this time period, like there was periods where Marvel didn't ship anything. Yeah, oh, they're yeah. doing yeah. trades one week and issues the next. They, 
They went digital yeah. for about half their issues. You you guys stepped in, and and some of the smaller publishers jumped in on a little bit too, but you guys stepped in and definitely filled the void. And and I, you're not giving it back, which is what I like. You, yeah, that's good. you're yeah. not losing that ground that you made up. Yeah, because I mean, because then you. I seem to remember you and AWA being the ones that I was getting my hands on, and of course they had uh, the what's the book? What's the book that, yeah. And you know their but their their thing about a pandemic, and you're oh, like, oh, what? How perfect timing is that? You were you yeah, yeah. publish that before this all happened, and but literally so you, side by you side. You guys had the book about the mask, and then he, they had the the plague. So the yeah, it was almost like, yeah, <laughs> it was like, wait a minute, is this a conspiracy? Did these two companies create? <laughs> Hang on, <laughs> no. <laughs> I know. I'm just being a wise ass. But, but God, God bless AWA and those guys and and everything. Axel and uh, the, that crew. Um, well, cool. All right. So you want to jump into innovation? I love that topic that you picked because you nailed it. So yeah. So so your first book. You you we're a fan of it. Um, I, we don't have an image of it, but everyone knows it. Fantastic yeah, book number it. one, and we'll throw it yeah. up here. But so, so tell us why you picked this book as your uh, first book. Well, you, you, you know, we're talking about um, breaking in and we're talking about uh, writing, drawing and being creative. And that's stuff that I talk about on Instagram and it's stuff I'm talking about in my YouTube videos. And I think what has been lost to most people is that Stanley and Jack Kirby, they were over when they did Fantastic Four number one. Now, here's, here's the thing. Now, Jack Kirby was the first Todd McFarlane, Alex Ross, Jim Lee. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first issue of uh, Captain America Comics number one, you've seen it where Captain America's punching Hitler. Okay. Oh, yeah. So that book sold a million copies. And the reason that it sold a million copies is because of Jack Kirby. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm going to go on a little tangent. And so have some hey, patience for me here. Long, for a second. long as it's about comics, we're okay with that. All right. Well, you're, you're, you're in fine company. That's yeah, all I'm talking about. Right yeah. Um, Captain America was not an original idea. And I mean that literally. Okay. Joe Simon, who was the writer, inker that co-created Captain America with Jack Kirby. Okay. Yeah. Joe Simon was the first editor in chief of Marvel Comics before Stanley. Okay. And Martin Goodman, who was the publisher, he had a rule. There was only one kind of comic book that he wanted to publish. He wanted to publish whatever was popular. Okay. <laughs> I've seen that. That's yeah. Now, here, here, did you just put up a Fantastic Four number one? Yeah, he had to show it off. Yes, sir. <laughs> Damn. I had to. I, I had to. I mean, I don't get a chance to show it off very often. Where, where do you live? <laughs> I had to be that guy. Are you, uh, are, are you going to be going on vacation anytime soon? <laughs> like frozen. I look I great in the right now. So, anyway. So, so, so here's the story here is, and, and Mike, I've, I'm, uh, I think you, you're, you're sort of a deep back issue guy. I think you'll get a kick out of it. Not that the other two of you aren't, but this is like super, super deep. Okay. So the first character that timely created was in the pulps and it was a character called the masked writer. Okay. They just brought Chuck him back for uh, Marvel 1000. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So here's where the masked writer is from. There was a Lone Ranger radio show. <laughs> and in the opener, they would describe the Lone Ranger as the masked writer mm -hmm. using those exact words. Okay. And Timely, which is the precursor to Marvel, just ripped it off. Just. Okay. Well, that's a good name. So exactly. And so when I say Martin Goodman liked whatever had been proven, like whatever was a hit, he wanted to do more of that. Okay. He would literally wait for things to be a hit and then go figure out how to copy them. Now the second, <laughs> the second character is Kazar and mm -hmm. Kazar is a blonde Tarzan. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he was created in the pulps before they did comics. Yeah. So Joe Simon knows this. And what Joe Simon does 
is he goes to Martin Goodman and he has a drawing, which you can Google if you just Google Joe Simon, Captain America. It's it's the famous Joe Simon drawing of Captain America as the character design. Okay. And he says, the company, it, 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 I'm going to call him Archie, but at the time they were called MLJ. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, because they yeah. hadn't published Archie yet. When they published Archie, they changed the name of the company to Archie. But then he basically says, MLJ has a superhero who is patriotic. Is that the shield? And he has a shield. And he is called the shield. Yeah. And he's basically like, I want to do this character, Captain America. He is a superhero who is patriotic, who has a shield. Okay. <laughs> and Martin Goodman's like, oh, a ripoff of the shield? Great. Done. Okay. So it wasn't the idea with Captain America that was the innovative thing that made that book sell a million copies. It was Jack Kirby's artwork was so next level. And I don't know what um, movie you've seen that blew your mind. For a lot of people, it was The Matrix, okay, that made you look at filmmaking in a completely different way. Some people, it's Lord of the Rings or, you know, like whatever. What is the TV show that made you look at TV differently? Was it Game of Thrones? I don't know what. But that's what Kirby on Captain America Comics was, is the way that he drew action was totally different. The way he moved to the camera, the way that he moved the figures, and everything that Jack did was gold. And in the 1940s, he was the number one guy. And he was, Simon and Kirby were the only creatives that were ever advertised in comics in the 1940s, the whole decade. They would do an ad, DC would say, you need to come by the, the um, the uh what what was it? It's the boy commandos. You need to buy boy oh, commandos. Commandy. Because it was by Simon and Kirby. And so he so Kirby has this run through the 1940s where he's the king. Okay. And then the Simon and Kirby relationship breaks up. They start their own publishing company. That's a different conversation. Mainline. They do that stuff. The Wortham stuff happens. Jack is has to go out on his own. And basically, when Jack shows up at Marvel. He has nowhere to go, okay? Jack Kirby's over, okay? He's 20 years into his career, and his best days are behind him, okay? Now, let's talk about Stan, okay? So Stan takes over. Joe Simon goes to World War II, and Stan takes over as the editor-in-chief. And basically, Stan's job is to do a million comics. Like, Martin Goodman loved to over publish okay and so stan would write and edit the books and his job was to copy every western every horror every science fiction just do knock off sort of like he was the bootleg version of whatever right yeah. and he wrote romance comics and he wrote everything and he basically just you know his job was just to churn 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 he was writing like 20 books a month or something crazy Okay. Well, the reason that the Marvel method, the original Marvel method, which is the artist plotted the book, happened was Stan didn't have time. Now, one of my great pleasures of my entire life was to work with Stanley and to publish him. I published three series from Stan. And I was over at his office and we were talking and working on story. And I said to Stan, Hey, I'm privileged. I get to drive to Beverly Hills. I get to go into your office and sit down and talk to you about story. And it's, you know, the journey of a lifetime and I'm thrilled, but there's a bunch of kids that are over at Boone and they'll never have an opportunity to meet you. They're going to have to go stand in a big line and wait three hours to be able to get your autograph. And would you be so kind as to come by the offices just before Christmas and just say hi, like walk in, it'll blow their minds. It'll be incredible. And Stan instantly was like, yes, of course, I'm happy to do it. It's awesome. It's fantastic. He, he, was, he was delightful. I, I had a great relationship with him. So he came in, and of course, instantaneously, there's this ring that's formed around Stan. <laughs> and he was making fun of our offices. He said they were too neat. They look like a bank <laughs> instead of like an uh, editorial office. He was razzing us and all this stuff. And I pulled this um, comic book out from the 1950s. Uh, science fiction horror that was called Menace. It was oh, yeah. by Atlas. Uh, back in the 
Okay. And I said, hey, Stan, I'm going to put you on the spot. The first story in this comic book, let me tell you what the plot is. The plot, and by the way, you wrote it, Stan. Okay. Here's what the plot is. <laughs> Here's what the plot is. The plot is mankind has created robots. They can pass for human. They are out in the population. And people are scared. So there's a detective and he's going through and he's hunting down these androids, these robots, <laughs> and trying to be able to tell which one's human and which one's an android. And at the Blade end runner? Of, yeah, and he at, likes the, at the end of this eight page short story, it is revealed that he is a robot. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, Blade Runner anyways, has like three different versions, so there's versions where he's an android, where he's not. So they didn't really get that idea from. Stan. Oh come on! Well, she Peter, always <laughs> drops. She always drops the origami unicorn, which means they have the same memory. I I have the definitive answer. <laughs> I can tell you this with 100 percent authority. Okay, <laughs> I went to Warner Brothers. They had a screening back when they did the director's cut DVD. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they had every single key like, creative. So they had both screenwriters. They had Ridley Scott. They had Sid Mead. They had um, the, uh, you know, they had 12 people. It was everybody that had anything creatively to do with it. And after they, they screened the movie again, they did the Q and a, and you know, what came up. Okay. And, um, it's not David Webb Peebles. It's the other screenwriter. Oh, I'm going to just die that I can't remember this guy's name. Um, the screenwriter said uh, he's not an android. And uh, Ridley Scott says, yes, he is. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and the two of them got into a friendly argument. And the screenwriter's like, I wrote the story. Right? And, well, it's my picture. Oh, is, right. it, is, it Philip, is it Philip K. Dick, the guy who wrote the novel? No, it wasn't. Philip passed away um, shortly after Blade Runner was released. Um, it's If you're looking at uh, the IMDb credits, there was uh, David Webb Peebles, who wrote Blade Runner, also wrote Unforgiven. But there's uh, Hampton Fancher. That's his name. Hampton Fancher. And so Hampton Fancher sat there and argued with Ridley Scott and said, "I wrote the I wrote the story, and he's not a he's not an android." And, and Ridley Scott said, "Yes, he is." So, <laughs> anyway, so I actually had I actually published uh, "Do Android Stream of Electric Sheep," which is what Blade Runner is based on, yeah. and I had the privilege of getting to know uh, Philip K. Dick's daughter, Issa Dick Hackett, and I actually asked her one time about this story in minutes. And she, of course, doesn't know because she was a, a kid uh, yeah. you know, when he, I mean, I don't think, she, I'm not sure she was born when the book was published uh, originally in 1968, Period Android Stream of Electric Sheep. But um, she said that her dad uh, definitely read comics. That's authenticated. That's a known fact. And so did he read comics in the 1950s and that idea kind of stuck in his head? I mean, who knows? But it is pretty amazing that um, there's that coincidence. Now, to get back to the topic of innovation and we're, we're talking about fantastic for number one. So here comes Stan Lee and he's been writing comics for 20 years and he's been writing the things that the other professionals don't respect, right? Yeah. It's knockoff stories. It's bootleg. It's the also ran. It's the watered down version of whatever's a hit. And these two guys get together and they create the fantastic four. And the thing about that, I think that's important to tell everyone is those guys were 20 years in on their careers. They were well into their forties. And if you think about what that did and how that changed everything. And now with Marvel as a brand, it's changed entertainment. It's changed the world. Now it changed comics back then, but this has changed storytelling universally. It's changed film. It's changed TV. It's changed merchandising. It's changed everything. And that's, Two guys getting together that, you know, Jack had no harbor. He had no company that would hire him. And he had Stan, you know, huh. 
uh, who was roundly dismissed as a writer because he'd written a bunch of uh, stuff that was not innovative and not, not clever. And so the thing about it is you've got to look at that and say, you know, it's never too late. And if you dedicate yourself to your craft, amazing things happen. And I think the story is incredibly inspirational. Uh, definitely, especially for somebody who's in their 40s. I can still create something that will change. You know, no, Pete, you missed the first part. They spent 20 years and then they created something. Well, you gotta, you gotta spend 20 years. I've been collecting comics for 20 years. <laughs> I've done a lot of things for 20 years. So, so that, that goes back to, you know, don't be the guy in the bleachers at the NBA game. <laughs> So it's important, <laughs> it's important to put, put the work in, but at the same time, you know, I think Donny Cates is the good bridge between the two, right? Is a guy that put the work in, had the craft and got the breakthrough. And yeah. so I thought, I thought that was worthwhile. So, all right. Um, do you, I mean, I, I don't know how this show works. Do you guys want to, I've been grabbing the mic. Just <laughs> we have been kind of it, uh, lately. So we're, we're just going to keep rolling. We'll, we'll, no. we'll and we, we're going to throw in some. We 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 talked about we we actually chatted back and forth about innovative innovative things that we saw, and just like not just some boom and other companies, but also just books in general. And we're going to drop some of ours into the article that we write, so to to counteract yours, but also to value your time and our time and whatever. But uh, the next book that you listed, and it took me a second. You you put Saber at first when I read it. I read Saber too. Oh, I wrote. I it should have been right. But it's pronounced it Saber, but it's S-A-B-R-E. S -A -B -R -E. Yep. So I, I read Saber Tooth, but then I was like, no, Saber. And the, for a book, now, the graphic novel, you, you talked about the original. That book's come up a couple of times in our shows yes. because of not not the graphic novel, but the series that started, that came out right. a, few, a little bit later because yep. of uh, John R. Cudi brought it up because of Billy Graham. Um, he did the, did the art. I love Billy Graham. So yeah. what a that, what a tragic I, loss. Yeah, it, it, it was a guy like I barely knew, and then he brought him up like, oh god, he's a freaking genius. Like when you talk about yeah, innovative exactly. styles and artists, and the what he did on Heroes for Hire, and then he was from Warren, and just and being a black artist at the time period and all that stuff. It was it was a fascinating interview. If you got time, well, which I'm well, sure, you know, sure you have. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you know, one of the things I want to really point out, and it was also on Black Panther. Don't yeah. forget. Uh, when it was called Jungle Action. The, the, one of the things I really want to point out for Marvel was Marvel was hiring a lot of African-American talent at that time. Yeah. So Keith Pollard um, had great runs on Fantastic Four and Thor. Uh, there's Billy, there's Ron Wilson. Sure. Like, if you read Marvel 2 and 1, I met Ron at, you know, he was going to New York and San Diego, and I just fanboyed out on him. You know, like, I mean, he, you know, that's, Dude, that's his, my childhood right there. Thing, I didn't realize, and I went back and looked at the, the thing run and I'm like, oh God, like it, yeah. really, it was pointed out to me. I didn't realize how just powerful some of those images were that he drew. Yeah. That I mean, was I've never been a thing. Right. Didn't Arcudi bring up a Yeah. That was Wilson one of his deals? three. He was like Billy Graham, Ron Wilson, and uh, Matt Baker were his big three. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, Matt Baker, you know, Matt, I mean, Matt Baker's. That guy, that guy's a genius. The, uh, but, you know, there was a ton of. I'm going to forget. I'm leaving out a bunch of other African American artists. But you know, during that time in the '70s, you see Marvel is. You know, Marvel's always been such a progressive place, and you know, there was a tremendous number of uh, Latin American artists uh, that were working at Marvel, whether they were Puerto Rican or they were from Latin America. Um, mm -hmm. You know, different different ethnicities, different different parts of the world, but they had always been really innovative uh, with bringing in different people uh, to do their stuff. So anyway, so that. Saber, the original one, the one that you yeah. want to talk about, nineteen seventy eight, yeah. I think, is the yes. year I saw. Yes, yes, yeah. And so let's talk about the creative team. So Don McGregor. So Don is uh, one of the true innovators um, in comics, and the thing that. So, so there's two series that Don is known for. Okay, the first is uh, Kill Raven, which ran in Amazing Adventures, mm -hmm. and what Amazing Adventures is this Kill Raven run is in the early '70s. Conan was the first licensed Marvel comic. 
1970. So Stan is publisher. Stan, so the so Martin Goodman had just sold the company to Cadence Corporation. And Stan saw this opportunity to become the publisher of the company. And if you ever wonder why at the top of those Marvel comics of that era, it says Stanley Presents, the reason is because Stan was worried. Stan didn't want to be the editor in chief anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, cause it was too much work to write everything and, and, and basically corral all the cats and Stan still wanted to be involved creatively with Marvel and shape its direction. But he was worried that the, the, that cadence would buy Marvel and realize that they didn't need him and show him the door. <laughs> and so Stan plasters everything with Stan Lee presents and an effort to, because, and the thing you got to remember is, this happens around 1970, and Jack Kirby had left two years before, and Steve Ditko had left four years before. And so the key creatives that had built Marvel had left. And Stan, and now this is my conjecture, I never had the conversation with Stan. But, you know, from, from my perspective, the way I look at it, all the books I've read and the people I've talked to, putting it all together, Stan was worried that Cadence would buy the company and show him the door and so he really asserts himself as the creative voice at Marvel. And arguably, you know, he was the editor in chief and the chief writer at the same time. There's, we've never really had that paradigm at any company ever. DC never had a chief writer that was the editor in chief and controlled everything. And so Stan's insecurity really puts him to the fore. Now, so he's, he, he gets the promotion, he goes upstairs to be the publisher. And he brings in his protege, Roy Thomas, to run the line creatively. And Roy says, I really love Robert E. Howard, and I want to get the rights to do Conan. And somebody in your audience will be able to vet this story better than me. But I want to say that the licensing fee, it was either 75 bucks or it was 150 bucks. But Stan thought it was too expensive and didn't want to pay it. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. And if you look at it from Stan's perspective, you know, Stan's perspective was just go in the other room and create a new franchise, right? Then because they gave it up. The then they gave it up to Dark Horse after that. Well, the, well that's that was after a while. That was, what, 275 issues. That was a you long got it time. For, you got it for essentially the equivalent of $1.75. And <laughs> you're going to get Little rid of it. Little problem figure. They, they ran the court. 275 issues. They figured we told all the Conan stories we got. Well, the, never. That, There's never too many Conan stories. <laughs> well, that, that Conan story is a different conversation, which I, I would happily go into why Marvel would let it go. But that's a different we'll, – we'll have a different video to do that. <laughs> but, but basically the business reasons behind it. But basically what happens is that pops – and then what you see is you see this run in, from 70 to 75. It goes into kind of 76, which is licensed comics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they start trying to grab everything that isn't battened down. Okay. So they start to go license the pulps. So the shadow uh, comes out from DC Comics. Okay. And uh, you see Marvel publishes Doc Savage. So they go for the authors that pre-existed before comics, and then they start uh, licensing everything that isn't nailed down. And like one of the ones, Shang-Chi, mm -hmm. like the whole story behind the Master of Kung Fu is that that is based originally Fu Manchu was a pulp character written by Sax Romer and was a villain. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out how do we do a villain series? And basically Steve Englehart and Jim Starlin decide that they can't. And what they need to do is they need to make the villain the dad, and then they need to make Shang-Chi the son, and that's how Master of Kung Fu gets created. They got to Star Wars it, or what eventually would become Star Wars. Right. <laughs> and so um, Paul Gulacy, I don't know if you pronounce his name Gulacy or Gulacy, but Paul... Gulesi. Lazy, good guy. Okay, really great. nice guy. I've, I've met him uh, in passing at a show, and he was terrific. And I've been a lifelong fan. But Paul, at this time period, is the hottest artist. Okay, Paul is working on Master of Kung Fu, and under Doug Minch's sort of like sculpting, the comic that they're doing 
is it's a James Bond comic. It's an espionage with international locales and sexy ladies. Okay. But it's starring Bruce Lee. That's the premise. Now, the original inspiration was Fu Manchu and the David Carradine Kung Fu TV show. So that's what Jim Starlin and Steve Englehart are doing. But they leave the character very early. And by the time Doug Mensch gets his hands on it and Gulasi's doing it, is Gulasi's doing this approach, which is James Bond, but starring Bruce Lee. And it's the hottest book. And when I was a kid, okay, I've got, I've got some age on you, I, I believe. But when I was a kid, if you were cool, like I, I, would li- I had an older brother and you would listen to the older collectors, right? And sort of like, yeah, 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 you're reading Captain America. Yeah, 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 you're reading Justice League. So is everybody else. Like if you're cool, you're reading Howard the Duck, okay? <laughs> and you're reading Master of Kung Fu. Like those were the books, right? And then later in the early 80s, it becomes Cerebus. Okay, that, those are, if you have taste, those are the books that you're reading if you know your stuff. So Goulas, is the guy, okay? McGregor, to get back to the licensing, so in the early 70s, they want to do War of the Worlds, okay? So the first issue of Amazing Adventures that features the Kill Raven storyline in it is a War of the Worlds story. Which and it's still drawn, understood. Like, it right. has nothing to do with War of the Worlds. Like, well, I mean. But it is. Yeah, like, if you plotted, think about Kill it's Raven. Plotted, it's plotted the same. Yeah. Well, the, the, setup, the, the setup, the idea is the tripods come down and they conquer the world. And the only thing is, is there's no resolution at the end, right? So basically, it's the Walking Dead version of War of the Worlds. It's yeah. where the story continues. That's well, fantastic. fantastic. And I love that cover. Ever with, and ever and ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> with Phil Raven and just then, standing there with his, like, blue vest on. And like, he's like, what's going on? Don't focus on the outfit. Okay. <laughs> and so Kill Raven and his little band... Okay, so McGregor takes this over. And if you look at the creative teams, they were going through, you know, the first one is written by Jerry Conway and then it's handed off to Marv Wolfman and they just hand the baton and nobody wants to write this book. I think Archie Goodwin's in there. And then Don gets his hands on it. And Don starts to write this really emotional, really cutting edge, really brilliant, um, serious literary now, this is the time period when people, it's starting to dawn on people that comic books could be more sophisticated. Mm. And Don is pushing that agenda forward. Now, clearly, Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams with the Green Lantern, Green Arrow stuff really blew that door open. Okay, but Don is working in that vein, and he's trying very much to tell a really serious story. Now, the other aspect of it is you put in the Panther's Rage storyline, speaking of Billy Graham from... Uh, jungle, uh, jungle Action, which is Black Panther. And for the audience that doesn't know, Don McGregor told a multiple chapter story with the Black Panther, which is basically structurally the movie. Okay. And um, it was, some people consider it the first graphic novel that was serialized. Okay. Because it's so multi chapter. If you go back and you look at any of the big two publishing previous to this, there's no clean, like the like the Galactus trilogy, you can't just cut it out and put it into a graphic novel. I mean, they do, but like there's continuing storylines before and there's continuing storylines after. There's cliffhanger, cliffhanger. This man, you know, just rolls right into this man, this monster. It's rolling from one to the next. Right. But, it, but you can pull Panther's Rage out and it's clean. Like you can put it into a graphic novel format. And so, and, and I, I will tell you, I have hung out with Grant Morrison and he has talked to me about how big an influence Don McGregor was on his work and how mind blowing the Panther's Rage storyline was to read back in the day when you're buying it off the rack. So that's Don. So Don's this huge innovator and here's Paul, who's this huge innovator. And basically in 1978, the direct market is just starting to kind of like become a thing. Mm-hmm. And both of these guys are, neither one of them are on the top selling book at Marvel. Okay. So they're not 
you know, Todd McFarlane doing Spider-Man, right? But they are recognized by fans as the best of the best. And so they step out and they go to, and now I'm really going to get out over my ski tips to so smack me around. Okay. <laughs> but I think that book, Saber, it's the first modern independent comic. Okay. Through Eclipse comics. Yes. Yes. That's the first. If you want to look at, that's images, that's Boom's great granddaddy. Yeah. So no, I did. Yeah. Eclipse was innovative when it came out and that was the book and it was like when you pull up pictures of the cover i mean it's like a black and, or a sepia tone cover like it's that's not right. even, it's a black and white or depending yeah. on how faded you get that's right yeah and the thing is is there was a company before that was called star reach okay mike friedrich created this company and they published a lot of big two creators like jim starlin okay like paul levitz like steve didco okay mm -hmm. but star reach is a little different and Star Reach was a little different because they kind of came out of the underground comics movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was more about, it wasn't continuing characters. It wasn't kind of franchise concepts. It was more about taking the Marvel and DC writers and artists that were interested in keeping their own copyright and just letting them do whatever they wanted to do. They are beautiful. They are beautiful books too. For for anyone who just wants some beautiful covers, just go get those Star Reach books. They're, they're incredible. Yeah. I have a full set, so I'm I'm all in. <laughs> but but I think when you look at like the model that Image and Boom and IDW and Dark Horse and everybody is operating within, like yeah. arguably there, there might be no Eclipse without Star Reach, but Eclipse is the first time that you see it commercially expressed. It's yeah, like, this is made for comic book fans. Look at this. And by the way, I don't know if you've copped to this, but the lead character is Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> when I look at the picture, I, and we'll pull, throw up, it, it definitely looks like Jimi Hendrix. No, no, no. It's oh, Jimi wow. Hendrix. <laughs> oh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> with, a, yeah. with a six Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> I'm not even a six shooter. It's like an old. No, Chris, person. I don't think you heard me correctly. It is. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've been corrected. Like, I'll go. <laughs> so, yeah. So, look at this book. It's like, you know, to me, there's no question. You see co other companies that come after, like Pacific, and Pacific was massively influential for me. Okay. Yeah. Pacific is one of my favorite comic book companies of all time. You're, and then you're talking you have, to guys making the Dave Stevens collection right now. So <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, amazing. True. And, and, you know, that's a fun story. They come out of San Diego comic con and um, the, uh, you know, Dave was in San Diego, you know, that whole scene, like that was very much tapping because Kirby was going to the San Diego comic con in 1970. Like he was at their first show and like they kept Kirby to do Captain America, they, excuse me, Captain Victory. We could do a whole show about Pacific and I could talk your ear off and bore you to tears. But the, um, cause I love all this stuff. And, but it's, I love Kamiko. I love all these early eighties, but I think Eclipse, like that Saber, that version, that's the first time you see it crystallized where it's like a repeatable framework that you look at and you go, oh, there's a modern independent comic book. And yeah. that, is you know dean mulaney i it was a thrill to meet him uh dean and jan are the guys that founded the company and i i got to know him a little bit uh, a couple of years back and uh, you know obviously with the pandemic going on i haven't been able to see him but um massive massively influential so and then the the last one that i would talk about is and this is a much more broad thing that kind of relates to me uh at boom which is mouse and so in, in the u.s and, and I think what's so powerful about Mouse is Mouse is that book, like, I can't think of a worse pitch. <laughs> right? What do you mean? Hey, uh, hey, want to read a book about the Holocaust? Yeah, want some Nazi rodents? rodents? Well, who would right. want to read that? Exactly. Well, I don't think it's Nazi rodents. The Nazis are cats and the Jews yeah. are rats or, yeah. or mice. Right. And so... You're, you're in this situation where it's like when people give that book to you or when you hear about that book or you get your hands on that book and you read that book, 
it is a staggering work of brilliance. Absolutely. But it could not be a worse marriage of material and approach. And I think that's its genius, right? It's like somebody's like, hey, do you want an avocado and peanut butter sandwich? Right? <laughs> and you're like, that sounds terrible. How is that one of the greatest works of literary fiction of the past 30 years? Yeah, right? No, what you're thinking is dipping your fries into a Wendy's Frosty. Like, why would you want to do that? But then when yeah. you do it, you're like, oh, this is actually kind of tasty. Hey, hey, somebody, some, hey, somebody dove to the bottom of the ocean and saw a underwater cockroach called the lobster and decided, let's cook that and eat it. Let's so, eat that. You know, exactly. human, humans, do, humans do strange things. <laughs> yeah. But still, like, he keeps doing that though. Was the uh, he did after that one? He came out. He of course had Mouse Two, and yeah, then he right. had a uh, note that he did the two towers. He tackled nine uh, eleven with his. And it's in the book itself is this giant uh, hardback yeah. graphic novel talking to tackling the two towers. Like it's mm. I can't remember what the book is called. I, ha I have it. I just haven't. I think it's in the shadow of two towers. Yes. So, so it's I, you know I, I've been I've been joking around a lot all night tonight, but I'm an English teacher by my day job. And, you know, when you talk about how to break into that kind of stuff for some of your lower level students, one of the things you suggest is mouse yeah. um, and a couple of others. You know, if somebody's a little bit more literary, you might say read Neil Gaiman Sandman or or something like that. But but mouse is always the go to. And it is it is regarded by students and teachers, much like any great work of American fiction. It, it should be. And, and Art Spiegelman yeah. is an artist, capital A. And, um, you know, he deserves all the accolades. And I'm a huge fan of the book. Uh, I just kind of want to point out as a publisher what an unlikely idea it is. And the thing that I think, the reason it's on the list for tonight is that that is something that teaches you the power of comics. Yeah. Right? If you make that into a movie, I don't care. Right? <laughs> It doesn't yeah. work, right? You make it into a TV show, it doesn't work. You make it into a novel, it doesn't work, right? Only comics can do that. And the thing to me that propels me as a publisher is sort of all three of these things as you put them together, right? Number one is it is never too late for anything. It's not too late for me. It's not too late for you. It's not too late for the next artist. It's not too late for the next writer. Like there could be somebody that's had a 30 year career. I could name your least favorite writer or your least favorite artist. And they're capable of doing the next great thing. And my job is to pay attention. Okay. Well, I spent off of that. You, you talked about James uh, Tinian earlier. Yep. He wrote freaking detective comics and no one cared forever. And then all of a sudden no. he does stuff. Well, well, okay. People like cared, it. but not in the same. But then he switches to Batman. It's the same character, but That's somehow right. people love his run on Batman. Okay, I'm getting to offending the Batman fans in the room here. Um, no, no, no. Like, it, it's just a different mentality. I think people who read, I don't know why. It just is. It's just. I mean, he and I'm not discrediting what he did. I'm just like, did he change as a writer when he switched? But well, like, I, really. I have ideas about that, but we'll talk about it in a second. So. <laughs> Fantastic Four, number one, so that's that. Number two is Saber, because that's the breakthrough of sort of the modern independent comic book, independent comic, right? Yeah. And then three with Mouse is I read that and I can I go as a publisher, I go, comics can do anything. Comics can tell any kind of a story. And that's where you see in my publishing things like Lumberjanes. You know, like when we did Kaboom Comics, nobody, I was told specifically by the business, the kids don't read comics. <laughs> I was told, I was told by the distributor, Diamond, they said, what are you doing? Kids don't read comics. Okay. And I had first read my comic, my first comic I read when I was six. And so I believed in the power of the storytelling that's in comics. And I'll tell you, when Lumberjanes was pitched, you know, it's like, hey, they're Girl Scouts that go to Girl Scout camp and they fight monsters. It's like the way that the female audience is now a part of the reading comics was not articulated at that point. Okay. And that was a crazy rolling of the dice, but I just believe in comics and I believe there are great cooking comics. If you haven't read them, uh, first <laughs> publish some of them, they're amazing. Like comics can do anything. 
And can. that's how I believe, you know, it's, it's how we they have can. an article t- hitting, I think probably, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow. If it's going to be Thursday, but the, the back nine we're doing where we're doing like the animated series. And one of the things I picked, I picked one of the dark wing, you know, you know boom books because thank you. It's just fantastic animated thank book. It has nothing to do with us talking to you today. It's just, when the topic was delivered to me, he's like, hey, we're going to do an animated series. I'm like, all right. I like Darkwing. I like I like the homage covers that you guys did with some of those, like, Kaboom stuff. Like, it's fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, and I would love you to tell me right now, we're going to bring Peanuts back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, I'm a ridiculous oh. Peanuts fan, and I miss yes. it. And we I are still publishing it. Peanuts. What's that? We're still publishing Peanuts. We just put out a Peanuts graphic novel. You, you, yeah, well, what you mean is the monthly, yes, the monthly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, no, I, I appreciate like it. I can't, yeah, 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 I hear you. I like floppies too, but I was going to pivot back and talk about, about else. what uh, was it, Detective Comics versus Batman? For, yes, uh, thank yeah. you. Oh. So, part of what happens with the Batman run, and now I'm going to be completely mercenary and I'm going to push my own YouTube interview with James Tynan. Okay. Uh, because he goes into it in detail. Oh, wow. But part of what happens there is he's given a very specific articulated time. So he's going to come on an issue 86 and he's got to be done on 99 or 100. It's, it's not clear which one. Okay. And it's like, this is it, bro. Hmm. Right. And so at that moment, that does something to you, right? Well, but yeah, you have to I mean, end, with end the, game in, in sight. Like, here's your finish line. Like, you're going to play it differently than if you're going to keep going. Like, you, Well, and for Detective, the thing you got to remember is he was the ringleader on Batman Eternal, mm-hmm. yeah. which was a year-long weekly comic. And he had come out of working with Snyder on Batman during the Court of Owls, which is a high watermark creatively on the character. Yeah. And so he had gone through that process. And so when he's on detective, you know, the approach of putting Clayface on and sort of making it a family that's a team. It's not really a team book, but it's kind of a team book. Right. So he was doing some things that were really different. And so, um, and had come off of big runs on Batman already and had really made his mark. And so then, you know, he cycles away from the character and then he's given that uh, time frame. And at that moment, then he's like, okay, I'm going to load, I'm going to load up the gun. I'm going to put all the bullets in the gun and <laughs> off we go. So That's what, uh, now you're, now you're making me want to go and watch your YouTube video. Good job. Like I, I just, <laughs> But like this is what I love, what we do, and what you're going to be doing. Which I, I don't like the competition. I mean, if you throw us some of your guys, no, there uh, is no competition. We're helping. It's all, it's all the same place. We're yeah, true. It's not. Uh, just love the comics. That's so just that's sick. Can we, for everybody, Chris. I know. Yeah, I know. It would be great if people would stop trying to compete and just share yeah. everything. Yeah, I threw. I, I was I'm joking not gonna, about not buy DC because I like buying Marvel books or whatever. Like we exactly. buy everybody's books. I can buy yeah. Boom books. I can buy Dynamite. I can buy everybody's books if I want. I buy I buy everybody's books. I buy Image, IDW, Dark Horse. I buy them all. I bought a Zenoscope book today. So. How, how great. <laughs> these guys are really nice. I like these guys. Yeah, so. they actually they are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being with us. I, I know you got you got so much coming out. I mean, I, I do have to mention, how did you come – or was it Al that came up with the longest title for a book in comics, we are only. How do you say? I can't even say it. We, we only find them when they're dead. Yes. I, I will, I'm going to help you. Okay. Do you know that garbage song? I'm only happy when it rains. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, now you'll never forget it. We only find them when they're dead. Because uh, I don't. It cracks. It's I, the only reason I say oh, it's shit. the longest title ever is because when you have to write <laughs> it every week because you have a great variant. <laughs> That comes with it. It's like, ah, oh, dang it! I got to write. Christian Ward's doing the variant, or uh, whoever's did this past week's. Uh, no, they didn't come out. I'm, you had a great second print that uh, Oliver did, I think. Or seriously, my mind is blown by that. I'm like, holy shit! That has the same like. I can't, <laughs> <laughs> I can't, like, just, I can't Pete, take it now. I'm like, poor Pete, you just exploded <laughs> his brain. Uh, good work. 
<laughs> do you have anything else that you want to like throw out there? I mean, you're talking about your YouTube channel. Of course, you got Berserker. You've been talking about that on every show that I've seen or th that you've been doing, which so, I love. So let me just let me make sure I understand this, Chris. Hang on a second. So you don't want to talk about Keanu. We can definitely do it. I, I also know I can go watch in someone else's thing. I just I want to know what you want to talk about. So if you want to talk about Keanu, I will gladly let you talk about Keanu and talk about yeah. the Berserker pitch and everything. Well, the you know for me, you know it it's interesting to me. The uh, we ruffled a lot of feathers. Yes, and by kickstarting that uh, book, and I don't even like to say that we kickstarted it because I don't believe that we did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the way that people use that term, and they they say crowdfunding, you know, we didn't need to fund that project. That project was funded. What we used Kickstarter as was a digital store to sell three volumes of a trade before it came out. So we did digital pre-orders of a trilogy, and you know, you can set up consumers would be able to order off of Amazon three volumes like that. It is super complicated and hard. Yeah. And the Kickstarter was a much cleaner way to get the message out. And the thing about it that was super exciting for us is we emerged from that process with an email list of Keanu fans that have never been in the direct market that we're going to email blast them and say, when the first issue of Berserker comes out, we're gonna say, hey, and you've gotta be careful about how you talk to people who've never read comics before, because it's very confusing. <laughs> and say, hey, you know, the first chapter of the book that you already ordered is, is coming out in stores right now. So if you wanna go to a direct market store and you wanna buy the first chapter, now you can just sit at home and we'll ship you the whole book, okay? But, but if you wanna get it now, it's over there. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you, you know, I've got retailers like uh, Larry Doherty from Larry's Comics that sends me messages and says that he's already got people calling him up that are Keanu fans that are pre-ordering the first issue. Uh, and so that was really, you know, it's like, how do you get people to read comics? You know, once we had Keanu, Keanu came in for your audience that hasn't seen the other YouTube videos that I've done and told the story. You know, we got an incoming phone call. Uh, we have a, a division of Boom that's dedicated to Hollywood. Um, we have a Netflix deal. And for feature films, we have a deal with the company that used to be Fox that was bought by Disney that's now called 20th Century. And we're over on the lot on what used to be the 20th Century Fox lot. And uh, the talent agencies know us because we have packaged writers and directors and actors. We just had a movie come out during the pandemic called The Empty Man. Uh, that yeah. was really 2,000 screens. And so uh, the agencies know us, and, and Keanu came in and pitched us this idea. And, you know, the way that he pitched it was he just said, I want to punch through dudes' chests. <laughs> and, like, I'm sitting on a couch, and he stands up in front of me and starts to just, like, <laughs> like act it out and he's just I just I just really want to punch through dudes' chests. Right. Stand up. Come here. I want to show you something. Yeah, no, dude. He's in <laughs> I, he's in so much better shape than me. Like <laughs> I am not a little man. Like a lady saw me the other day and she said, You look like Stone Cold Steve Austin. So like <laughs> I am not a wallflower, right? You, you still want to mess with John Wick though. But yeah, no, Keanu would wipe the floor with me. There's like not a not a conversation. So um, so anyway, you know, he pitched it and he was like, look, you know, I have these different ideas. The character's an immortal. We're gonna start the story in Babylon and like ancient Mesopotamia. And you know, this is kind of what I think the tone is, and here's sort of ideas that I've got. I mean, it was a three-hour meeting of him pitching these different ideas that he had. And the thing about it is. You know, he told stories about buying Wolverine, the limited series number one off the rack. Mm. You know, like he's a real comic book fan and um, he loves the medium. And when we went to him and said, you know, we think we can get comic books into the hands of people who've never read comic books before. He was thrilled that we would do that with Berserker because he would consider that an honor that Berserker would be the first comic book that somebody would ever read. You know, for him, that's like a dream come true. And, you know, we, we ruffled all these feathers with folks 
But, you know, we worked hand in hand with Kickstarter to make that. We called them up and we were like, hey, we've got Keanu Reeves. We want to do this comic. And here's how we think it lays out. And we're going to ship this book to the direct market comic book shops first. And then you'll collect it into a graphic novel format. And that'll go to shops, comic shops. And then just like every other boom book. And then we're going to ship the graphic novel to the book trade. And so Amazon and Barnes & Noble will get it. And we're going to offer it on Kickstarter. And Kickstarter thought it was great. They loved it. And they helped with, you know, they helped us every step of the process. Well, I think uh, that, that, that part was genius because it brought people to Kickstarter that normally, like, I know I went to Kickstarter when I heard between that one and, uh, is it Scott Snyder's Nocturna or uh, like those right. two books, like brought me back into kick. Like I occasionally have gone to, but those brought me into where, you know what, there's some, there's quality on here. And then yeah. like, we've talked to now some indie guys, Bob, uh, Bob Sally. And he was like, dude, I got my first start. And it was, it was so hard. Now I can understand from his view. Like if you've, if you've hustled your way through Kickstarter, how frustrating what you guys did would be to go, hold on a second. You're bringing in the big boys and does, but I'm like, dude, I went and looked at your thing and I, I bought your thing because I w went and looked at Berserker. Like I wouldn't have done that if it hadn't gone, if I hadn't known there's a Keanu book there. Um, yeah. You bring, you bring more people to the platform. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. have to be like people just starting out. I mean, what was it? Uh, Jimmy Palmiotti, you know, when he did his book, yeah. on Kick, he does his book on Kickstarter. It's like, you just want to do your own thing. That's a good place to do it. Like where well, you don't look, have look to at the board game in this business. The board, oh, wow. the board game business yeah. is, you know, like IDW has kickstarted Batman, the animated series on Kickstarter. Huh. Like Batman, the animated series, IDW. Yeah. Right. They've done a title you think would sell itself that you don't need to do Kickstarter, but it's not just about like crowdfunding. It's just kind of reaching that broader audience. It's also to see interest too. You want to gauge interest and see, yeah. is this something that we should do? This is a passion project. We'll push it this way. See what it looks like. See if people are interested in, and then, you know, you'll know in five minutes, whether or not and people are interested. If you can get something limited by going through this route, like by yes. doing that, like it's yes. an incentive for a lot of collectors to say, yep. hey, I can get a book that not everybody's going to get because I'm on it before other people because I'm going on to Kickstarter. Well, and, yep. and you look at those, you look at the collectible, the really collectible stuff, and it's expensive. And yeah. the thing about the retailers is they don't want to order it because they have to pay non-returnable. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, here's a $100 hardcover. Well, they got to shell out 50 bucks, right? Sometimes based on margin, maybe 55 and you know you're going to order five of those, right? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. tough. Hope to sell so for us, it's an opportunity to get that. I love the deluxe edition, scratch and sniff, super da 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 da, signed by your mom. I'm in. Yeah, right. I'm that guy. Like I'm a hundred percent. Like I always buy that if that's the version. And I was talking to the staff before we launched Kickstarter, and they were all they looked at our high end tiers and I did all those tiers and they thought I was insane. And I said, you don't understand. None of this stuff is going to make it past the first day. None of it. And it was gone in four hours. Yeah. It was just wham. Right. But I'm the audience. So I know yeah. what that's like. But the thing is, is I look at Kickstarter is like, this is, this is like comic shops, comic shops, is Marvel and DC are there? You got little guys breaking in. You got everything, right? It's the whole diaspora of what you can do, and you know it's it's a it's a pre order framework for you know for for product is is it's a it's a it's a retailing framework. Yeah, and it's it's not hard. Like if you have something that's super limited, it's like well we only have ten. It's not hard to find ten people who are going to want that. Like. There's right. like it's not that hard. Like you you put this out into the world, it's like finding ten is not a tough ask. In, well, in and you need cases. to watch out. You need to watch out for me because I'll click on ten and I'll buy them all myself. <laughs> no, and that definitely, I've seen that. And of course, I mean some Kickstarters have been smart. Like there's the seventy five, uh, the the seventh level where you can be a retailer packet and you can buy five copies of. And what I love, like I tried to, I think there was one Kickstarter I called Mike up who has a, uh, works at a shop and I was like, 
hey, do you think your shop, because this has great cover, and they never got back. I'm like, damn it, I don't have the, because you required a store shop code or something uh, like that. Uh, uh, they're, but, they're checking you, Chris. I'm trying I know. To <laughs> back in the system, man. But, uh, no, yeah, that, actually, the, the book looks, if you, if guys, if you haven't seen it, the cover looks amazing. Um, the it freaking, it's Keanu with Band-Aids yeah, on the like face about to kick, punch the crap out of some. It looks awesome. Yeah. When well, it comes out two weeks. No, no, no it comes out in February. February. Here's how February. I picture the team. Um, I'm going to say something to you, and I, I, I'm going to. I know that I might have named my company Boom, and I'm a shy retiring wallflower that never says anything outrageous. But <laughs> th this might press on our friendship, okay? But <laughs> I don't. I, I think the central pitch with Berserker. Is what if Keanu Reeves was Wolverine? I can definitely. Now the character is older than Wolverine, so people are going to take me to task about the one to one, and he doesn't have claws, and I get it. There's differences, yeah. but one, I don't. I don't I think buy that, there's... and I did buy that. Like it's coming to me. Like, <laughs> like I, <laughs> even after it got canceled because it was supposed to come out soon, like I canceled and and moved to February. Like, I reordered it. It's still coming to me. I'm thank you. It. I don't think that there's a single comic book fan that doesn't want to see that. Like, no. Don't you just want to be like, even if you hate the idea, you just want to buy the book and be like, what the hell is this? Keanu Reeves is Wolverine done. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, and we're not talking about like, you know, it, it's like, you know, Keanu from you know, my own private Idaho or something like that. Like, again, this, this is, John Wick. People go see John Wick these days. Like he's that was a deep cut. His career and that, that was a deep cut, man. <laughs> okay, I love my own private Idaho reference. So okay, got nothing but respect for you. Now, the thing, the thing I would point out to the John Wick fans, and this is not a conversation I've had with Keanu, so this is not from the horse's mouth. Okay, mm -hmm. I, how I look at it is. You know, Wick is about, there's a sense of beauty to it. Like everything's ornate. The architecture is gorgeous. Everyone's yeah. wearing beautiful Armani suits, right? The choreography is very sophisticated. Yeah. And the color Golden palette. Dance. Yeah. And the color palette's beautiful, right? And it's very clean. Like everything, you know, it's ferocious, Right. But it's very clean. And like, I think that Zerker is kind of going completely 180 degrees the other way and going down and dirty and like just like hyper masculine and just like nasty and hairy and just like nobody's in our money suits. Everybody suffers. You know, it's just like gritty, 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 dark, 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 dark. You know, like Wick is dark, but it's like, it's very much like, you know, two assassins having a, a very yeah. uh, professional conversation, you know, and, but this is like, I'm going to grab you by the throat and I'm going to try to gouge your eyes out and like. <laughs> if I'm taking what you're saying, I'm seeing like Matrix Keanu here where it's a lot of filigree. It's a lot of, you know, almost dance. It's like, it's beautiful, like motion and this and that. Wick, he brought it more close contact. Like a lot of the fighting is very like close. So now we're taking it even further than with Berserker, where it's it's just real. It's you're in it, like it's you're cool. It. I'm looking, I'm looking I'm forward in. to that. That's good. That's cool. Yeah. So I'm so in. going back to the business side, do you predict this will be your biggest book, like from issue one, or has it? Do you even have that print run already nailed down? Or uh, we don't. I don't have numbers, um, but I think the book's going to be big. Because you, I mean, like. I, it's like something killed like Fear 11 and 12 seemed like it was like double and tr like 10 times as much as, of course, w the first issue. But like the fact that you're having one for 75 and one for 100 variants on these books, and you have some multiple stores doing uh, store variants and everything. And then, of course, the I'm only happy when it's raining. Well, I can only kill the dead. Uh, <laughs> like that had a huge print. Like it seems like you're now having these, these books that have these giant things. And then, of course, you have this big huge thing coming and everyone's the anticipating there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited. Like I love seeing what you got, but then you have lumberjanes. It's 70 issue 75. Yeah. And then it, 
So, We've sold over a million copies of Lumberjanes through all the individual issues and trades and everything. That's great. And, and that one does and, better in the trades, doesn't it? Like, like I, I see that in libraries, and I see that at... It's a monster. Like, like if I told you the numbers, it would make your head explode. And the thing is, is HBO Max is developing that as an animated show. And if that thing goes, it's going to be nuts. It's going to yeah. be completely yeah. bananas. That's awesome. Uh, th thank you so much for being with us. It, thank you. I, I love I loved hearing yes. what thank you. your innovation and the, because I, I do think of what you're doing as innovation, like just, just some of the things you've done. And I thank have you. to be honest, I haven't paid attention as much as, I mean, I know you've been around since 2005, I think. Uh, yep. and, but I haven't been paying attention because I mean, there's always only been the big two in an image, but this year you, I hate to say you use the pandemic. It feels like you use the pandemic to just get your name in there fighting for your space. And I, I, I think that that was innovation, taking advantage yeah, of something smart is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So the, um, the, you know, I, um, I have some fun here because my first proposition for tonight's topic, when you were when Chris was asking for three books to talk about, as I said, let's talk about our three favorite boom books. <laughs> and, uh, I'll tell you, I got the nicest email back, which had a incredible sort of like I have two daughters, I've got a six year old and an eight year old, and like Chris was like, "Hey, I understand <laughs> that you want to talk about your company." <laughs> I was like, damn, Chris has skills of like <laughs> telling somebody no in a way yeah. that is softest, nicest, sort of like can't push back on it. Chris, 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 it's okay. You can blame me if you want to. We can do this publicly if you want to. Uh, Chris, Chris, Chris definitely did it. But yeah, uh, uh, yeah, you can blame me. <laughs> we want to we feel also, like an advertisement, but at the well, same time, not that. Again, we want I you to talk about Darkwing. I love yeah. Watson Future. I love Something is Killing Children. I love Joyride going back. Like, there's tons of boom books that I love. I just didn't want the implication or the idea that, hey, you're talking about this because yeah. well, that's who you and have. You know, on. here's the, there's but tons of those kinds of shows on, on the internet. There's tons of those kinds of shows on YouTube. And we just wanted to have fun with you and geek out over some comics and talk exactly. some biz. And, and well, it wasn't about, and we're, and we're happy to advertise your stuff clearly. We've been talking about it for the last no, half no, hour. No. I, I appreciate it. I, first of all, I'm, I get to tease Chris. So that's important. <laughs> Okay. I like it. Keep going. <laughs> and then second of all, what I'm implying is the reason and, until Mike told me the truth and Peter started throwing out, <laughs> throwing out things. But what I was implying was that the reason that Chris didn't want to do that was that he has come to the company recently. And so he doesn't have the deep cuts. Oh, 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 right. oh, okay. so, well, mine would have been all peanuts kaboom books. So. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, but no, I was going to pull out some deep cuts, but but B and Puppy Cat, and I was, oh. was going to try to try to see how deep I could go because I can definitely we still go have deep. the article. We can put the yeah. stuff in the article. We just don't <laughs> have to. I love it. Well, yeah, Peter, yeah. Peter, you'll you will be gratified to know that we just got the first. Oh, I don't. I think I just caught myself. <laughs> I, I, yep, yep. You almost got to the there, but I'm gonna. I'm going to bite my tongue, but anybody <laughs> watching really closely will be able to figure it out, and Peter will figure it out afterwards, I'm sure. Mike looks like he's figuring it out right now, so I'll, yeah. I'll be quiet. I'm um, trying to put all the pieces together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's there. It's there. Yeah. I'll be quiet. So anyway, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was oh, terrific. No, thank, you. thank you. Especially enjoyed at the end being able to tease Chris, even though Mike <laughs> and Peter wrote it. All right. So, um, Thank you for your time. Support your little retailer. Absolutely. So, yes. you know, um, I know that there's a um, CBSI has a has speculation in the title, which is very scandalous for my retailer friends. Uh, there's a lot of retailers that. Well, what's that, weird is the three guys you're talking to are the three guys who write articles that really aren't the speculation guy. <laughs> yeah, we don't it, actually. We write. Uh, we are all our articles. All our articles are about the cheap books that you can buy that are just beautiful that aren't worth anything. Yeah, and we I just look at what comes out on Wednesday. Ultimately, we just yeah. look at we do. Well, and, and and you know, I think it's important. Well, even even when we talk about speculation, you know, the thing that I would say is, 
the I was a speculator 30 years ago, back when Jim Lee was drawing Uncanny X-Men. And what I did was I pre-ordered my books. Mm -hmm. And so when you're pre-ordering with the retailer, you know, you don't ever want to be the guy that's grabbing a stack of 10 when there's only 10 copies and going to the cash register and demanding that they're sold to you. You know, and so I just yeah. want to get that in at the end no. is just say, you know, use your love of comics. And I don't care if you're speculating. I don't care if you're investing. I, you know, I hope you're reading because they are comics. Yeah. But at the, at the core of it, what I care about is support your local retailer, uh, work with your retailer. If you're going to speculate, if you're going to invest pre-order. And I'll tell you this as a publisher, pre-ordering is really important. Because when we get these these orders that they come in at final order cutoff, you know, if you're not pre-ordering something that you believe in, um, oftentimes the publisher will give up on a project because it wasn't supported. And yeah. so you should support the things that you believe in. You should support the things that you love. We're all one big community together, and we have to work together. Yeah, absolutely. Let's keep it alive. Keep yeah, it alive. Absolutely. Support your local Thank power you. shop. Thank you for saying all that. That's fantastic. And thank you so much again for your time. This is really fun. It was it was a blast. I loved it. It was great fun. Someday we'll be at a convention. We'll all get together. It'll be a lot that of fun. That sounds good. Probably sooner rather than later. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. It. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.